or the movie Le Mans 66? The one about Ford's victory at the 1966 24 Hours of Le Mans. Some of you have seen it, while some others may know the story, but I don't want to talk about this. I want to tell you about the previous year, the 1965, because something incredible happened that year. At the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1965, raced a ghost driver. And it wasn't just any race. It was the last race in history where Ferrari won the overall classification. And on that car, on that Ferrari which gave the last victory in history to Ferrari, two drivers were officially racing that day. We're talking about Mastin Gregory and Jochen Rindt. And yeah, this is because in those years, the teams were made of two drivers. And think about driving 12 hours each with those cars. By the way, I, I don't know if you know Jochen Rindt. But he was sadly famous for becoming a Formula 1 world champion after losing his life. Yeah, in fact, in the free practice of Monza in 1970, he died in an accident. But he was so many points ahead of Jackie X that he still won the championship. Anyway, back to us. Two names will remain in history forever in that 24 hours of Le Mans in 1965. But in that car, shrouded in the fog of the French night, a third driver is said to have gotten on board, whose story is among one of the darkest secrets in the history of motorsports. We're talking about Ed Hugus, the ghost winner of Le Mans 65. But who is that guy, Ed Hugus? Hugus was born in 1923 in Pennsylvania, and he grew up between Pennsylvania and Ohio. After the Second World War, he became interested in cars, and became one of the first dealers of Carl Shelby's Cobra. He started racing in 1952, he participated 12 times in the 12 hours of Sebring, and 9 times in the 24 hours of Le Mans. Well, this is the official story, because the legend says that there was a 10th secret appearance in the French race. June 1965, the United States and the Soviet Union are in the midst of the Cold War. But another war is being fought at Le Mans, Ford versus Ferrari. I don't know if you know it, but in Le Mans, exactly like in many other competitions, there are the official cars managed by the car manufacturer, and there are the private teams, which are bought by private and managed privately by people and teams. And here, like in every other race, all the eyes are pointed on the official teams the official Fords and the official Ferraris. But something incredible happened that day. First, the official Ford, which were in the lead, had some breakdowns. And then, after a few hours, the same fate happened to the official Ferraris. And what happens when the official teams break down? The private teams rise up. And that was a great opportunity for the private teams to take the lead. In the first position, we have the French Pierre Dumais, who personally entered his Ferrari, which he shares with the Belgian driver Gustave Gosselin. In second position, we have another Ferrari, the car of our ghost driver. It is the number 21 of the North American racing team, driven by Rint and Gregory. Rint and Gregory has already lost almost half an hour due to an injection problem and are trying to regain their positions. Their night stint is very quick and they're gaining time lap after lap. But before dawn, the fog falls. Gregory struggles to drive in these conditions because he was wearing glasses so thick that Carl Shelby used to joke about them comparing them to the bottom of Coca-Cola bottles. And he couldn't see a thing. So he decided to stop to the box, exhausted by vision problems, so that Rint could take his place. But there was a problem. Rint wasn't there. Nobody could find Rint. The team looked after him everywhere, but he was gone. I mean, you're running the most important race in motorsport history, and when it's your turn, you're not there. Rumors said that Rint didn't care that much about that race. They also said that he got there right before the test due to some contractual problems, that he wanted to push the car so hard in order to break it. And there are even those who said that he had a dinner in Paris that night. I mean, the night of the race. But you know, rumors are rumors, and whether they're true or not, we will never know. What we know is that Rint isn't there anymore, and Gregory, due to his side problems, cannot make it. And this is where Ed Hugus, our ghost driver, comes in. So, what was Hugus doing at Le Mans? Hugus was also supposed to participate in that race, in a third car from the North American racing team, which, however, they didn't manage to finish in time, so he was registered as a backup driver for Rint and Gregory, for the Ferrari number 21. So, long story short, Gregory returns to the pit. There is fog, he can't see a thing, so the team manager finds Hugus and asks him, did you bring your suit and helmet? 
Come on, get dressed, get in the car and drive for a while. So Hugus gets on board and completes a very good stint. Runs very fast and catches up the leaders. So at the end of the stint, he gets back to the pit lane and gives the wheel back to the owners. So, well, nothing out of the ordinary, you may say. I mean, he was the backup driver. Well, the thing is that for the official reports, Hugus never drove that car that night. That's right. Hugus did not do that night stint. But I mean, after all, he was the backup driver, right? So where's the problem? Well, the problem is that the regulation states that if the backup driver takes the place of the official driver, the official driver cannot rejoin the track. Exactly like in football, you know, when you replace one player, that player cannot go back on the field. And that is, if Hugus got on the car that night to replace Rint, he should have replaced Rint for the whole race. But instead, after his driving stint, Hugus gave the car back to Gregory, which completed the race with Rint, which after that has shown up again. Officially, Ed Hugus never drove that car that night. The legends say that he pretended to be Gregory. And among the technologies of that time, the darkness, the tiredness, and perhaps too many glasses of wine drank that night by the race marshals, no one noticed anything. The man of the fog did his duty, secretly, in total silence, before settling in the margins of the history. After that, the race continued. In the morning, the car that was leading the race had a puncture, giving the lead to the car 21 of Gregory and Rint. After some hours, they will cross the line as heroes, despite some big problems with the clutch and the transmission almost broken. That night, a private team beats the giant official cars of Ford and Ferrari. And among the other things, with the last performing car, because they were driving the 250 LM. As mentioned in the beginning, that was the last victory in history for Ferrari at 24 Hours of Le Mans. And in some pictures and videos, we can see Ed Hugues sitting on that car, going with Rint and Gregory to the podium, even driving the car himself. But for 40 years, nobody ever talked about the Hugus case. Officially, that race has been won by Gregory and Rint. And for 40 years, the glory was just for the two of them. But somebody seems to know something. But nobody wants to talk. It will all remain secret. And even today, we don't have many evidence. Also because there are no witnesses still alive. The first one to talk about it was the Italian journalist Mario Donini, in his book dedicated to the 90 years of the 24 hours of Le Mans. Donini says he received the tip from the driver Brian Redman and started to dig to find the truth, which seems to came out in 2005, 40 years after that race. In fact, on May 24th, Hugo sent this letter to the fan Hubert Barada. Dear Hubert, thank you for your kind letter of May 19th. It was very kind of you to remember me. Some writers have been telling me that I have driven more times at Le Mans than any other American. I don't know this to be a fact. Talking about 1965, as you know, I had my own entry for the 24 hours for many years. This year, I was to drive a Ferrari of Luigi Chinetti in the race. However, the factory did not finish the car in time. So Luigi put me on as a reserve driver on the 250 LM. During the night, about 4 AM, Masten, Gregory, had gone out in the LM. A lot of the famous Le Mans piece of fog moved. And Masten, with his bad eyesight and very thick glasses, came out and could not see well. Rint has disappeared. No one knew where. So I finished the last hour or so of Masten part. And Luigi told me many times later that he had informed the pit official about this. However, as Luigi said, maybe they were too busy with a wine bottle behind the pits to do so. He was disappointed, and so was I. Celavi, again, thank you. Hope this helps. And Hugus. One year after writing this letter, Eddie Hugus dies at the age of 83, with perhaps the satisfaction of having told the truth about his victory at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. This is the incredible story of the ghost driver of Le Mans, a man who gave Ferrari the last overall victory in history, but no one ever knew about it for 40 years. This is a story of the past, made up of drivers who pretend to be other drivers and race officials too drunk to realize it. Signaler une anecdote qui ne manque pas de saveur, c'est que le deuxième pilote de cette Ferrari victorieuse, Joachim Rint, un jeune autrichien qui est le deuxième pilote de Cooper en Formule 1. Regardez sur la ligne 3, là-bas. Je vous les annonce. Et voici l'arrivée victorieuse de la Ferrari numéro 21 de Gregory Rint, escortée par trois autres Ferrari. Incroyable, la victoire. De la voiture numéro 21, la Ferrari numéro 21.